speaker. Uh, okay. So now I'm going to talk about some uh, strengthening of uh, what Geoffrey just described. So this is joint work with uh, Ron Rosblum and Daniel Wicks. So um, I'm going to look back at what uh, Geoffrey uh, talked uh, before. And what, so pretty much what we built is a designative referral NISIC. So just to take a step back, we have a prover and a verifier. But now summer is approaching, so they removed their hat and shaved. So that's how they look like now. And pretty much, so, so the, um, there's a series in the sky. And given this here as the prover, using a witness for, uh, for a statement, can send a proof to the verifier. And then the verifier, using some special verification key, can decide to accept or not the proof. So what uh, I'll be ma mainly interested in during uh, this part is um, the setup assumption that we make. In particular, the setup assumption that we make is that there's a magical entity that both publishes a series in the sky, but also gives this uh, secret key to the verifier. So in particular, the um, uh, setup is ca um, kind of complex in the sense that the trusted party has to interact with every verifier that uh, participates in the protocol. In particular, if there's many pairs of, say, prover verifier that wants to participate, then the trusted setup has to um, talk to every verifier. So a natural question is uh, to relax this trusted setup assumption and to have something that is much simpler. In particular, it would be nice if we uh, could make something work in simply, uh, by using simply the setup of a NISIC. So what do I mean by that? So um, that actually defines somewhat naturally the notion of a malicious designated verifier NISIC, where the setup is really just a CRS. So there's a magical source and entity that publishes a CRS in the sky, and after that can go offline. After that, any verifier can just look at this, uh, at, at this CRS and pick himself a secret key. So that will be his verification key. But now, in some sense, the uh, proof um, uh, produced by the prover has uh, in, uh, to depend in some sense to this verification key. So what the verifier does is uh, he, uh, he also picks a public key that depends on this verification key and put that in the sky. So now, given this CRS and this public key, any prover looking at both can uh, publish a proof and uh, so generate a proof pi. And now the verifier, depending on this um, uh, verification key, can decide to whether uh, accept or reject the proof. So in particular, uh, the, only, um, the only change we make is really in, some, uh, in, the setup, uh, in the setup phase, in some sense. And so the protocol uh, still um, um, has a strong flavor of designated verifier and ISIX, in the sense that, for instance, the proof are privately verifiable. And, uh, there's still hope that this will be easier to construct than NISIX. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to uh, shift the trust of the trusted party to the verifier. And part of the verifier could be malicious for, you know. So what we want is really to ensure that whenever the verifier is malicious, then security holds, so, so in this case, zero knowledge. And part of the verifier can pick his pair of keys maliciously. But actually, from the point of view of the prover, it's not even clear there's even any secret key associated. So what we really want is that the zero knowledge property holds given arbitrarily uh, maliciously generated public keys. And in that sense, the security that we get is much closer to the NISIC and also the setup, in the sense that the only thing we trust is really uh, that uh, a magical entity put a CRS in the sky. Um, just, uh, just a quick remark. So this is uh, the notion of um, of a designative, uh, malicious designative verifier NISIC or MDV NISIC. And if I just rewire the arrow, another way you can look at that is really that we have some kind of two-round zero knowledge protocol. But what makes it really interesting is that the first uh, the first message is reusable. So that really what gives this uh, non-interactivity flavor. Okay. So now the uh, the natural question is how do we build that? So the roadmap will uh, follow pretty much closely what uh, Geoffroy talked about. So Geoffroy just showed that if we start with a VPRG, you, you get NISIX. And if you start with a designated verifier version of, um, of uh, PRGs, you, you get a DV NISIX. So naturally, what I'll uh, focus uh, here uh, onwards is to focus on the malicious ver version of that and show that pretty much that suffices for NISIX and how to build a malicious uh, MDV PRG. Uh, OK. So um, recall, uh, how do we use a DVPRG to implement the NISIC engine? So here, the prover will choose a seed. 
the seed along with the series we define uh, uh, many, many uh, uh, random bits. And the prover will also have uh, generate proofs that bits are generated correctly. So now to implement the hidden bits, the prover will simply send a short commitment to the seed along with hidden bits and lo uh, local proofs that those bits are generated honestly. So this um, translates directly into the malicious flavor, where the verifier now picks himself his key and gives him, uh, gives, uh, publishes a public key in the sky. Okay, so now the only thing that changes, if, um, if, the, um, if the verifier is honest, everything is the same as before. The only thing that changes is when the verifier is malicious. And what we used for a charge with zero knowledge of the designated verifier in in the end is really that when uh, the prover gives a local opening to some bits, the other bits still remain hidden. That's really what makes the hidden bits uh, uh, zero knowledge uh, go through. So we want that uh, naturally to hold given maliciously generated public keys. Uh, and it's not too hard to show um, that pretty much this syntactical uh, thing didn't change the, the proof, and uh, malicious DVPRG uh, implies uh, malicious DVN physics. So now we reduce the problem of constructing uh, MDV and uh, ISICs to the problem of constructing uh, malicious, uh, so MDV PRGs. So the natural step is, well, how do, how do you construct that? Um, so let me recall briefly, uh, the uh, in order, like, slightly rephrase the construction of row 4. And a natural question is to check whether the, constru uh, the construction we gave before natively uh, satisfies the property we want. So again, you have a, 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 a seed, like a commitment to a seed, so that will just, just be a group element, and S will be the seed that is chosen by the, um, uh, by the prover, and this is the same as A uh, in Geoffroy's talk. So in the CRS, there's a lot of different group elements. Uh, Geoffroy called that G3DBI. And pretty much, you define those hidden bits to simply be those uh, group elements in the CRS raised to the S. So now there's also another part in the CRS that allows you to check whether those bits have been generated correctly. In particular, you have some group elements uh, that, um, that help you prove that pretty much um, uh, S1 and G have the same discrete log in some sense. So Jofra talked about the, the uh, twin DGS check. Another way to see, uh, to see it is that we actually have a designated verifier uh, NISIC for a kind of DDH language, and that, that's exactly Kramer Shoop. So that's just another way to look at it. Uh, okay, so now uh, we can directly change the um, we can directly change the syntax to handle uh, verifier that picks the um, the public key, and that will be the part that allows them to prove uh, allows the uh, prover to prove uh, whether the bits are correct. And now what we want is that some kind of resilience whenever those group elements are generated uh, maliciously. Um, so say the, the verifier wants to attack the first uh, hidden bit. Well, a natural thing to do, uh, so, so in particular, he won't get the, uh, the uh, proof for the first bit, but a very uh, easy thing to do is to simply rewire. So in particular, given the CRS, he can just set the last element of, um, uh, of his public key to be the same element as the first bit of the CRS. Now, given how the proof works, Actually, just receiving the proof directly reveals uh, the first bit. So it seems like very easy, and we broke it uh, pretty easily. So is uh, all hope lost? Well, um, it turns out we can fix that somewhat easily. And how do we fix that? We'll simply make all the uh, hidden bits depend on many more group elements. So what do I mean by that? Now we'll have many, many more group elements than the number of hidden bits that we want in the end. And what uh, we'll do is simply to pick some random graph. And now every, um, every hidden bit will dip depend on many random different uh, base group elements. OK, so uh, how the, uh, well, and also like to check the proofs, now we we'll need to give the uh, appropriate group elements raised to the S. So how does it help us? Well, now uh, suppose, the, uh, again, that the verifier wants to learn something about the first hidden bit. Now with high probability over the graph, um, well, so first, he has to actually recover, um, if we plug just some uh, your favorite hardcore bits, he has to re uh, recover all those group elements raised to the S if he wants to do anything uh, meaningful. And um, in particular, over the randomness of the graph, there's at least some group element that does not appear anywhere in the other hidden bits that the, uh, that the verifier has to learn if he wants to learn anything about the hidden bit. 
So in particular, for the simple mix and match attack that I described before, uh, you can also argue that for um, sufficiently um, high number of group base group elements, that also, uh, that also happens. So if the verifier manages to, dis um, to do anything meaningful with the first hidden bit, he, will, he can actually compute some HI to the S uh, like by itself. So that sounds we made progress. But again, that's uh, s uh, simply for a very, uh, very restricted class of attacks. Um, yeah. So what, what we show is that actually if we pick this uh, random graph in a slightly careful way, uh, you can actually prove security against any, uh, any uh, adversarial strategy for the, um, uh, any malicious verifier under a slightly stronger assumption that's called a one more CDH assumption. So it's like a one more version of CDH. And um, that will uh, directly give a, de a malicious designated referral on ESIC for one more CDH. And yeah. So next, uh, Shu is going to talk about uh, compact uh, preprocessing ESIC, I guess. Uh, so 